I give this talk, particularly if I give it outside the city of Atlanta where I live, I actually live in downtown, I know that when I talk to, you, to folks about the fact that the government is here to help you, I'm going to have some reticence and some pushback to that theory. Now, understand, I come to that position from a long line of folks. My grandfather was an engineer with the Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, and when he was building power lines across East Tennessee and northern Alabama and north Georgia, he would show up and say, I'm here from the government, and they'd say, get off my land. And he would politely say, well, I'm sorry you feel that way, but we're going to proceed on and build our towers, and there's not really anything you can do about it. So, and then as I mentioned before about shaming folks who are sitting in the back and asking them to come forward, my dad's United Methodist minister, he's retired from active service, and then I spent eight years total, total time in the Marine Corps. So between one, very, one system of social governance or another, we've been around this business for a while. Now, most people, when they start talking about improving their DX communications, they want to talk about how can I get my signal focused and over the longest distance possible. And that almost always includes consideration of a tower of some variety. And it's not, it becomes a conversation in your household of not I want a tower, but I need a tower. My station needs this additional assistance. Now, in my household, I live with someone who doesn't think a tower is a beautiful thing. Some of you may live with someone who doesn't think a tower is necessarily a beautiful thing either. And I'm sure, as I live and breathe, that your neighbors don't believe a tower is necessarily a beautiful thing. But we're going to talk about how to deal with those folks as we go along tonight. But deciding what you want to do and how you want to get there, it can be the easy part. And I say easy part with a fair amount of irony because if you've looked at a Roan catalog or if you've looked at some of the tower catalogs and the options that are available to hams, not only is the budget as high as you want to go, the options of what kind of structure you want to build is also as multifarious and multitudinous as you can imagine. So figuring out what you want to do, how high you need to be, how high you want to be, are all part of this process, but it's the easy part. Because dealing with your local government or dealing with your neighbors is actually the more difficult piece of, of this process. You can, you can figure out fairly easily, based on the math or based on where you need to fill in your DXCCs or where your interest in communications may be, what kind of tower you need to get in order to get your signal bumped up high enough at maximum legal power to get a signal to New Zealand or to Australia. So that I need a tower and what am I gonna get? That becomes the easy part. The more critical part is where do you live? Now, the wonderful thing about Forsyth County, heaven bless them, is no matter where you live in the county, you've got a coming mailing address. But the number of people who actually live in the city limits of coming is very, very small. And I was involved in the last SPLOST litigation between the city and the county. There was, you know, a lot of pushback from the county that the city wanted so much of the, of the uh, special local option sales tax allocation when there's so few people who actually live in the city limits of coming. That ultimately ended up being resolved, but even if you've got a mailing address for a particular location, that doesn't necessarily you live within the authority of that jurisdiction to tell you what you can and can't do. When I lived in Gwinnett County, before I got tired of my commute into the city, I had a Duluth mailing address, but I did not live in the city limits of the city of Duluth. So where you live matters. And as we have an explosion of small communities and an explosion of uh, new cities, particularly in northern DeKalb, uh, northern Fulton counties, to some extent in uh, parts of Gwinnett. Where you live matters as these new communities try to come online and figure out how they're going to regulate land use. The 
the, the point of all of this is that when you look for where you live, you actually have to go to the county itself and figure out whether you're within the city limits or not. And there are services available online. You can go to your county GIS department and they have maps that show where your lot is and will define what jurisdictions you're in, what voting precinct you're in, what political uh, geographic areas you're in, and also what political jurisdictions you're in with respect to the city, or city limits or the county. We are not gonna talk much about homeowners associations. I was talking with Jack Fletcher back here a minute ago about his homeowners association and the challenges that they, they provide to HAMS. And some of you may have read in the most recent ARIES or in the AWRL e newsletter, there is a bill that has been introduced in Congress to address the application of PRB1, which we're going to spend a lot of time talking about tonight, but it's basically the authority of the FCC to reach into a homeowners association and tell them what part of their covenants and restrictions are going to apply to amateur radio. That bill has been introduced, it is still in the subcommittee, it has not even been heard in the subcommittee yet. The chances that it will be heard, I believe, in this Congress are slim and none, and slim packed its bags in 2008. So the ch we are probably gonna have to have that bill reintroduced in the new Congress in January with the 114th. And though, so that bill will work its way through the process, but it's gonna take a while to get there. It is akin to the bill that was passed in 1991 when Congress reached out and told homeowners associations you cannot restrict these small satellite dishes for DirecTV and Dish Network. It's, it's a similar kind of legislation to that. So it is not a blanket interference with the private right of contract, but an, an imposition of federal um, uh, um, federal interests and the application of those federal interests to increasing the ability of hams to, to uh, use their license. Homeowners associations, as you know, is a matter of private contract. That's true to a certain extent. The difference is that most of the time, a private contract between you and me is one where you and I negotiate those terms together. If you move into a homeowners association, you may not have actually negotiated those CCRs with the original covenanter. That's the person who filed those things, the developer of your subdivision. If you're one of the first people in the subdivision, you may well have, but they're not gonna negotiate those individually with you because they're gonna write whatever their blanket rules are, file those with the superior court, and those become the rules forever and always as it applies to that particular property. And when I say run with the land, that's what I'm talking about. The pro those restrictions attach to the property itself and don't allow uses inconsistent with those plans or with those restrictions for the life of those, those subdivisions, however long the, those houses actually continue to exist. Now, when we talk about property rights, we're talking about a bundle of sticks. I want you to bear with me for a little bit of legal analogy, if you will, for a few minutes. When General Oglethorpe created the colony of Georgia and he got the grant from King George III to create Georgia, there was a, 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 a presumption at the time that the king held all property rights. And by granting the authority to Oglethorpe to create the colony of Georgia, the king divested himself of his authority over the land that became Georgia to create this new, this new environment. As we have moved down in time, that idea of sovereignty still exists. The government is the original grantor of a piece of property. And the original grantor can keep back pieces of that bundle over time as the property is developed and the property is sold and transferred. It is not uncommon, particularly in Texas and parts of uh, the Midwest, for people to sell their property but to keep the mineral rights. You know, if somebody discovers oil, I want to make sure that oil's mine. I don't want it to be the person I sold the property to and I didn't know the oil was under there. So you transfer all of the right and interest in the property, but you keep back a little piece of it. So each time that something is cut back, you're taking out a stick from the bundle of property owner's rights. 
that concept of sticks also applies when we're talking about zoning. Zoning is the sovereign's authority to restrict the use of a particular piece of property and to hold back one of those sticks in, in the part of the um, transfer of the property. Among the things that are held back is zoning, which we just talked about, noise ordinances, for instance. I can control what kind of noises you can make and when you can make them. In the city of Atlanta, you cannot use a powered um, yard device, I think is how it's described in the noise ordinance, before 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning. Okay, when you are seven feet from your neighbor's house, like we are in Grant Park, that's important because I don't want to hear them using their weed whacker at seven o'clock in the morning on a Saturday when it's the only day of the week I get to sleep in for any length of time, right? So the governance, the, the government and the, and the sovereign keeps back some of those things to be able to tell you how you can use your property. The reason zoning was created, and zoning is really a, a, uh, a something that came about after World War II. Before World War II, there was almost no zoning ordinances anywhere in the country. So you could have factories built right next door to residential areas. You had mill towns right next door to factories. I mean, that's the reason we have Cabbage Town in Atlanta. Cabbage Town was a, was a mill town for the cotton mill that was right on Boulevard near the, ra the railroad tracks. And everybody who worked at the cotton mill for pennies a day lived in Cabbage Town in property that was owned by the, by the plant immediately next door to where they worked. Well, people who came back from World War II decided that they didn't really like the idea of living immediately adjacent to factories or the creation of a, some new industry coming right into the middle of their particular neighborhood. So zoning was created in the 50s and 60s as, an, as a means of controlling how that happened. It also was a means of controlling growth. Where did the house, new houses get built? How did they get built? What kind of property, we, what kind of size lot are we going to allow in different types of um, developments? All of that is controlled by zoning. The concept of new urbanism is what you see in places like Atlantic Station, where you have work and residence and uh, play and retail all in one location so that people don't have to travel and get in their car to go do things. They can simply walk downstairs or ride the elevator from their residence, they go to work, they come home, or they go to the movies, or they go to a restaurant, and it's all within one neighborhood. So the new urbanism is actually a return to what used to be very common in uh, pre-World War II America, where people lived above their businesses, they walked down Main Street and did all of their shopping and all of their uh, commerce within their neighborhood. If you decide you want to build a tower, your first step ought to be doing some research. And whether that research involves hiring somebody like me or just talking to somebody like me, or if it involves you doing research on your own, you gotta look into what the rules are. I highly recommend Fred's book to you, K1VR. Uh, Fred has written the Bible on antenna regulation in the, in the United States. He has a lot of really good ideas. His CD is replete with forms and ideas about how you can go about this process and how you ought to consider this process on your own. Now, I will tell you that Fred's a lawyer, so there's parts of it that are written in absolute legalese, um, which even for the best of us is a little hard to decipher. But the point is that if you're going to do this process, the very first place you want to go is this book. There's also um, your local ordinances are usually in Georgia available online at municode.com. Uh, if you type in that web, web address, you can pick select Georgia from the menus. It'll then show you what cities and counties are available. You can go to that particular jurisdiction and you can then search those ordinances. You can also look up a lot of the case law that we're going to talk about uh, with findlaw.com. There's also research, um, low cost research available with uh, companies called Fastcase. Um, where you don't have to pay exorbitant prices like you would with a Westlaw or a LexisNexis to do legal research. So it is, it is possible to learn these rules 
before you walk in the door. And I will say to you over and over tonight, you will hear this as a refrain from me, he who knows the rules rules the game. The person who walks in the door with the most, most information really controls the dialogue and the conversation. Come on, moved, thank you. Now, the second thing I want you to do, and my picture isn't showing up as well as I'd like it to, that's actually a graphic for the D-Day in invasion in June 6, 1943, uh, um, or 44, excuse me. So it doesn't have to be as detailed or as exorbitant or as elaborate as Operation Overlord, but you do still have to have a plan. You have to have done your, your ham radio homework in addition to your legal homework. What do you want to do with the tower? Why is it necessary to what you want to accomplish with your federal privileges? How is it different than what you've already got? What, what benefits can you articulate that this new antenna installation will give you that you don't currently have available to you? Where are the ranges? You don't have to articulate those to anybody out of the gate, but you need to know in your own mind that if I, I'm asking for 108 feet, but if I go down to, 100, down to 88 feet, I get 97% of the signal strength improvement that I wanted to get. So do I, how does that 20 foot drop in antenna height change the analysis of the eff efficacy of a particular antenna? Does that 20 feet matter under all sets of circumstances? What's your budget? How much money are you gonna spend on the antenna? How much are you gonna spend on the installation? Are you gonna have to have a concrete footing poured? Are you gonna have to have somebody run conduit from the remote location where your antenna is built into the house so you can get the coax in without it being uh, simply buried in the dirt so that, so that it would then be impacted by the elements and the uh, uh, rainfall? All of those things matter. Most important one is, when do you wanna get this done by? When Brian and I started working together, he actually hired me last October. We got his permit approved for the construction of his antenna at the April Board of Commissioners meeting. So six months between when we started working together and when we were able to get final uh, approval for his project. That is just about the fastest I've ever done one of these. Frequently, it takes much longer. I have a client who I'm, for whom I'm litigating a tower application out of Cobb County. The motions for the judge in the federal court to decide the case on have been pending for seven and a half months. I mean, we, we lost in the superior, in the, um, at the Board of Commissioners in Cobb County in, the vote was in April, they uh, published their written findings of fact in May of 2013. We had the case fully briefed, filed and fully briefed and ready for the judge to consider by October. It's now the middle of June, or I'm sorry, the middle of July, and we still don't have an answer. So what, how fast do you want to get this through becomes a crucial piece of this conversation. Now, two disclaimers. George C. Scott is the greatest actor in the history of the world, and Patton is the greatest movie in the history of the world. All right, and like everybody else, that's just my opinion. He didn't really, Patton isn't the author of this. I will concede that there was um, the, the concept of no plan survives first contact with the enemy was actually come up with, was identified by a Prussian general in the 1840s, but Patton learned that idea when he was at West Point in the teens. And he made it famous because nobody could make things famous like George Patton could do. When you have your plan, you have all of your research, you have all of your data, you have everything that you could put together, that plan will only be good until the first time you publish it to somebody else. Usually that first conversation is somebody in the county or the city's planning office. Sometimes it may be one of your neighbors. But as soon as you publish it to somebody else, they're gonna start lobbing rounds at it. And they're gonna start poking holes at it. 
And they're going to start telling you about all of the things that are wrong, that are wrong with your plan, about why it is that it's going to be this most heinous event that has ever occurred in, the, in their lifetimes. And they moved way out here in the country because they didn't want to be next to a tower. And by heaven, they're going to do everything in their power to make sure that you can't build your tower where it's most effective. So even though you've got a plan, and even though you've got an idea about how you want to do things, your mission in this process is flexibility. You have to be willing to accept that what you want and what you get will likely not be the same thing. As much as you would like to have that 140 foot tower with stacked 20 meter uh, beam antennas so that you can boost a plus 30 decibel signal towards Oceana, you may not be able to get that 140 foot tower. Now, the rules may allow you to build an absolute forest of 35 foot towers that you could put parabolic dishes on and have those act co collectively as a, an antenna like the very large array does, but you may not get what you absolutely want. So flexibility has to become the watchword. All of our conversation and all of our interaction with local government begins and ends with their ordinance. The, the, the statute that controls the use of your property has to be our starting place because that's the location on which or the rules on which the city planners or the county planners discretion is circumscribed. It's the rules under which the, the council has said, or the commissioners have said, this is how we want our property in our community to be utilized. So we're gonna restrict your uses except as we've previously defined it. So you have to be able to articulate within the confines of that ordinance, what it is and why it is you wanna be outside of it. Why are you entitled to an exception? Anytime we're dealing with, with statutes, we start with a plain language. Now, every lawyer who's worth his salt will tell you that no word means exactly what it says it means or what it looks like it means. I mean, this is not a political comment, it is simply an observation. When the Supreme Court ruled that the Second Amendment, first of all, applied to the states, and second of all, did not allow restrictions on the right to bear arms, the right to hold weapons, except with a most rest least restrictive means by local government, they read the first clause of the Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the freedom of independent states. They read that as an introductory clause. Now, most folks, when they're reading the Constitution, read every word as being necessary. They were put there, the words were put there for a reason. But the Supreme Court decided that that first clause of the Second Amendment didn't really mean anything. The second clause, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, becomes the important part. That's the, what they call the operative language. So every time you deal with language, whether you're at the Supreme Court of the United States or you're at the Superior Court of Forsyth County, the words may not mean what they actually look like they should mean, but that's where we have to start. And it's only if there's an ambiguity in those words do we start having problems. For instance, the Forsyth County Uniform Development Code says in the tower chapter, which is chapter 10 of the code, that the tower chapter does not apply to licensed radio amateur towers. Whoopee, we don't have to worry about the tower code. We can build whatever we want to, right? Wrong. Because later on the code says that if you live in a residential district in unincorporated Forsyth County, you can build up to a 35 foot tower, but nothing taller than that without a special use permit or what they call up here a conditional use permit. So just because we're dealt with or we're dealing with the plain language of the ordinance doesn't mean that that's where the conversation starts or stops because you're gonna have to marry different provisions of the code together in order to reach an understanding of what the rules are. All right. Cobb County, that's where this example comes from. 
Cobb County says you can build as many amateur radio antennas as you want to as long as they're 35 feet or less. You can build one antenna that is up to 75 feet. Above 75 feet, you've got to come to us and, come, and apply for a special land use permit or a SLUP. Um, now, after you read the plain language, the county planning director is quoted in the local paper as saying, if his tower was only 75 feet tall, we wouldn't have a problem. We would just, we wouldn't have an argument. We wouldn't have, be having this conversation. But the fact that he wants to build a 140 foot tower changes the dynamic. Now, his ordinance says, I get one 75 foot tower. There's already one 75 foot tower on the property. He's saying in the record or in the public media that if I wanted to build five 75 foot towers, he wouldn't have a problem with that. So what controls? His interpretation that he's now made in the public media is an admission against the county's interest? Or what the commissioners wrote in their statute? And as soon as Judge Evans rules, we'll have an answer to that question. So what do you do now? You've got your plan, you've got an idea of what you wanna do, how is it you actually go about figuring out what you're gonna do? One of the things that you need to have in your plan is an FCC ruling from 1985 that's commonly referred to by VEs, um, VCs, excuse me, as PRB1. PRB1 is a memorandum opinion of the Federal Communications Commission that basically says two things. First, we're not gonna deal with HOAs. If you live in an HOA, you're on your own. Sorry, we're not gonna interfere. But if you live outside of an HOA and there is a ordinance that deals with amateur radio, we will preempt, that is federal law will supersede local law so long as the local law either has an absolute cap, we're only gonna allow a 35 foot tower and nothing above a 35 foot tower. That's what Forsyth says. Or if it allows a range, the restriction has to be reasonably accommodating to the federal privileges of the licensed radio amateur. Now what that means in language that people who don't have law degrees can understand is you get a thumb on the scales of the analysis in favor of the radio amateur. The Supreme Court decided in 1803 that federal law trumps local law. If there's a conflict between what a state says or what a local government says and what the federal government says, federal government wins. So if federal government wins, if federal government, if the supremacy clause means what it says, and that is that the, supreme, the federal law is supreme, then we're going to do our analysis with a thumb on the scale and on the side of the radio amateur, and only to the extent that the restrictions imposed by the local government are the least necessary to affect an important governmental interest, will the government be allowed to restrict the creation and construction of your tower. The ARRL's been back at least twice, both times trying to get the HOA extension, and now we've got legislation that's been introduced to try to get that expression of congressional intent to allow the FCC to speak further on the particular question. All right. Now, just because we get a thumb on the scale does not mean we necessarily win. Local government has an important interest in health, safety, and welfare. Welfare can include what's the view shed look like. View shed is a $4 lawyer word or $4 city planning word that says, when I look out my back window out across when I'm doing the backyard, when I'm doing dishes and I'm looking through my window, what do I see? Do I see a 108 foot tower in my backyard or do I see pretty trees and, and deer riding, running across the backyard. That's what view shed means. That's part of the welfare piece. One of the other things that's interesting that could be included is safety. 
a number of jurisdictions in the metro area have restrictions on how far away from your property line your tower has to be. I'm in litigation with DeKalb about what theirs means because what, it, what the ordinance says is the tower has to be at least half the height of the tower away from the side property line. So if I've got a 75 foot tower, I have to be at least 37 and a half feet away from the property line. The way the county planning department is interpreting that is if I look at the radius of the beam on top of the tower, the edges of that beam have to be half the distance from the property line. Okay, now if I put a 40 meter dipole antenna that's on, it's part of a Yagi uh, tri-band antenna on top of a tower, the arms of that 40 meter dipole are going to be 30 feet from the center of the tower. So if I go 30 feet from the center of the tower and I'm in the middle of my yard, I'm five feet from the property line at the edge of that antenna. And what the county is telling us is that that 35 feet has to measure from that edge of the, of the Yagi, not from the center of the tower. Okay? Just because it says what we think it says doesn't mean that's what it means. So we're fighting with DeKalb County about what that means. Now, PRB1 is not an absolute preemption because that's what the ARRL had asked for. They, they asked for a ruling of the FCC that as a matter of law, there can be no regulation of amateur radio antennas by local government. And the FCCs, we're not going that far. We're gonna go part of the way there, but not all the way there. So there's still the opportunity and the obligation and the ability of local government to rule and to regulate, but there have to be limits and there are restrictions on what can happen. There's the balance we've talked about and it restricts the opportunity of local, local government to create absolute bans. When Dunwoody recently recodified their ordinances, they changed their tower regulations to basically exclude the construction of any tower in the city limits. What they didn't tell us when we first saw that and everybody in the amateur radio community went, you know, basically bonkers for about six weeks is that there's another portion of the code that deals with amateur radio that says you can build an amateur radio antenna up to 75 feet, but it's not in the tower ordinance. There's no reference to it anywhere, and you have to know that it's there to go looking for it. Because if you just search amateur radio antennas in Muni code, it doesn't come up. So part of what I do for free is to go schedule meetings with the uh, planning director in Dunwoody and say, I'm sorry, I'm confused. Can you help me be unconfused? And they help me be um, become unconfused. I disseminate that information to the amateur radio community in Dunwoody and Northern DeKalb, and everybody's less, less annoyed. But part of the conversation is that it is a conversation. I don't go in there with both, you know, both six guns drawn saying, you people are in violation of federal law, you need to change your ordinance. I walk in the door and say, I'm sorry, I just read this, this doesn't make sense to me, please help me understand. And they're willing to help me understand because I'm not walking in there like the big bad wolf ready to blow their doors down. We talked about some of these arguments when we talked about what the plan was. Why do you need this tower? That's the first thing you have to answer. You have to be able to articulate and to quantify why this tower or why this antenna system matters and changes things. And then you have to, the second most important thing, even though it's the last item on the tick list up there, is what's wrong with the ordinance that it doesn't allow you to do what you want to do? What is the restriction on your ability to, fulfill, to fully use your federal privileges? A PRB1 argument needs to be part of the record. Because remember, when you're dealing with administrative law, and that's what all of this is, it's not, you're not litigating a case like you would in, if you're getting ready for a jury trial. You're part of an administrative process. Any federal appeal or any review by a court is based on what you have done 
in the local jurisdiction. It's the evidence and the arguments you've made in the, lo in the lower jurisdiction. So when you have the opportunity to raise these questions, you raise them. In Forsyth County, when we met with the planning director, we said, we have these concerns. They said, put your concerns in writing, let us know what the problems are. So we made, in response to that question, all of the arguments on all of the points that we had about what was wrong with their ordinance, what was wrong with the way that they had conducted their particular codification of what they thought the rules were. In that conversation, we very politely made a PRB1 argument. You might wanna think about how this applies in terms of PRB1, because if there's the absolute cap, which this code section seems to say that there is, your ordinance as a whole, as it relates to amateur radio, is void. And they came back with an administrative interpretation that says, this is how we're gonna interpret, how we're gonna read our ordinance. And as I pointed out to the county commission chairman at a later time, their interpretation so directly conflicts with the plain language of the ordinance, I think the planning director overstepped his bounds. But since we ultimately got the tower that was gonna effectively accomplish the mission we were there for, that's not something that's gonna get adjudicated. But it's an argument we start off with, and it's a, it's a question we raise early so that everybody knows what the, what the, the framework of the conversation is. And the more often that the county or the city will let me frame that conversation, the more often I can have them talk to me on my terms rather than me talking to them on their terms. If I can set the rules of engagement, they've already lost. Not always, but most of the time. But how do we get there? You get there by being nice. You get there by having a conversation. You get there by walking in there, not as Matt Dillon trying to you know, police the, uh, the streets of uh, Dodge City, but you walk in there being nice. And you're nice until it's time not to be nice. And when it's time not to be nice is when you're there at the final meeting of the county commission and the county commission chair out of the clear blue sky after weeks and weeks and weeks of people reaching out to him by email and telephone and refusing to have any conversation with you at all says from the dais of the county commission, we're going to postpone this, this, this issue related to the amateur radio antenna for a month to see if we can't work things out. Then it's time not to be nice. Then you write the letter that says, your county, your county uh, uh, planning director usurped his authority by interpreting your ordinance direct contravention to the plain language that you as the board of commissioners have adopted, and he is dead wrong about what the rules are, therefore your entire ordinance fails as it applies to this application. That's when it's time not to be nice. That got their attention to the place where all they asked for was a 10 foot reduction in the height of Brian's antenna, and they approved it five to nothing. We talked about process a couple of times. Let me go into a little more detail. We're talking about multiple steps, multiple meetings. In most jurisdictions, there is a planning commission and a, com and a policy maker. The planning commission is volunteers or people who are paid a very small stipend for their time, who are members of the community who make a decision about whether or not a particular application should be recommended for approval to the governing body or not. That's where your administrative record gets made. That's where your, your factual presentation gets made, in addition to all of the steps and all of the things that you've done in the application process before then. After you go through the planning commission, whatever they call it, then you go to the governing bar to usually. Sometimes there's an intermediate appellate step like there isn't in the city of Atlanta. You have a zoning review board who is the initial uh, place where the conversation happens. Then there's the board of zoning adjustment which is basically an appellate body. And once it comes out of BZA, then it goes to the city council for their final vote. So there can be two steps, sometimes there's three steps, sometimes there's as many as five steps. Any appeal that you take is on the record that you create during all of these intermediate steps. When we get to court, we don't get to introduce new evidence. 
We don't get to have depositions. We don't, have to, we don't get the chance to get new, new evidence in front of the judge. Everything that we review on or everything we have a conversation about in court deals solely with the record we've created in the, in the city or the county. And just for the record, anytime you over-process something, you end up with Velveeta cheese. That's, yeah, I know, it's a lame joke. You have the opportunity to, when you appeal to go to either superior court of your county or to federal court. Ordinarily, when you deal with land use issues, your appeal is to superior court because you're only dealing with a local question. Because this case involving radio antennas applies and seeks for an adjudication of the uh, affirmative application of federal law. We have federal, what's called federal question jurisdiction. And that means that we have the means and the opportunity to go to federal court. Federal court Article Three judges are appointed for life. They don't ever have to stand election. Your local judges have to stand election every six years. If they irritate a local community, they may have an, uh, the inability to, to achieve reelection the next time around. And any judge who wants to tell you that they're not really a politician is probably not telling you the truth. All right, yes, you can do this yourself. You do not have to have somebody like me walk you through this process. But should you? And I ask the question, should you, simply because the other side's gonna have their lawyer. When I say the other side, the local governing authority is gonna have their lawyer. Whether they're in-house staff like they are in Cobb or they're outside counsel like they are here in Forsyth, they're gonna have a lawyer advising them step by step what the rules are. And frequently it helps to have somebody who talks the same language as the other side. I've been doing local government law most of my career. There's not very many city and county attorneys in the, in the metro area that I don't know personally. So if I have an applicant or an amateur radio client who wants to do a zoning or a build a tower, the first thing I do is call one of my colleagues and say, this is what we want to do. Who do we need to talk to? Here are the problems I see. Here are the questions I want answered. Here's the conversation we need to have. Talk to me, tell me what you want to do. They'll usually put me in touch with their planning office. They'll usually stay out of it until we get to the end. But that initial conversation lets them know, A, that somebody that they know is involved, B, somebody that they have usually had represent their local jurisdiction at some point is involved, and C, that I'm not pulling punches. I'm not here to play, you know, overlord and, and master of the universe over this situation. I'm here to try to have a conversation. It's time to be nice until it's time not to be nice. Then there's those folks. I try not to be pejorative when it comes to, to neighbors but I have yet to meet neighbors who are immediately adjacent or who have to look at a new tower who are not against it for a host of reasons. We have a legal burden, okay? We have to articulate to the governing authority why it is we want our tower. That's our legal burden. If somebody wants to oppose it, their legal burden is to demonstrate why it's a bad thing. All right, and if their argument that it's a bad thing is that it's gonna reduce their property values, show us. Go hire an appraiser. Have them do the comparables, just like you would if they were gonna sell their house. What's the value of your house as it sits here now without the antenna in your backyard? How much is the value of your house once we put the antenna in your backyard? Oh, by the way, that you can't see anyway. In dealing in Brian's case, we went through four different experiments, three of which were requested by the neighbors. The last one was requested by the, by the county to show where the top of the tower was gonna be and how little of it you could see through the 
tree screen that was 175 feet from the neighbor's house back up to where the property, the tower was going to be built. We put a piece of the, a section of the tower and then did the math. How hollow will it be? We did a balloon test. We, we filled a helium balloon, raised it 108 feet in the tower. Where's the top of the balloon? Can you see the balloon over the tops of the trees? And when we showed them that a 108 foot tower would not be view, visible over the tops of the trees, then they didn't believe us about how high the trees were. Okay, difference in grade, 45 vertical feet between where we're taking the pictures are at the neighbor's house compared to where the bottom of the tower is. And that's also where the bottom of the trees are that are at that level. You go 80 feet up from that, that's 125 feet of vertical clearance for the tops of the trees. Now, as far as Brian's concerned up there with, with the, at where the average grade is, he's 10 or 20 feet above the tops of the trees where he's located. But from a perspective standpoint, there's a 20 foot difference between where the top of the tower is and where the tops of the trees are gonna be because they're looking up a 45 foot grade. But as we talked about at supper, math eludes folks. When you walk in with the math and you walk in with the calculations and you walk in with the technical data and you walk in with all of the things that you need to do to establish why the tower works, why it's not visible like they think it is, why it's not all of these parade of horribles that they're going to accuse you of, you don't have to be mean and ugly. You can be nice, because you can't fix stupid. One of the gentlemen that we were dealing with in Brian's house asked us in the public comment set meeting, I want to make sure that you're not working for the NSA and you're not listening in on my home conversations with this big old antenna on your, at your house. What part of amateur are you not hearing, sir? I, I've had other folks say that they don't understand why that's funny. I sat there in utter disbelief that I was being asked the question. Here's the point. Most of the time, with these folks, there's nothing you're going to say, nothing you're going to do, no evidence you can bring that is going to change their fundamental belief that they're right, you're wrong. Because your evidence conflicts with their sincerely held beliefs. And when evidence conflicts with beliefs, beliefs win. And it doesn't matter what conversation you're having, but particularly as it applies to antennas, that's a true statement. My goal as a volunteer council is twofold. My mission is to help provide education, not just to local governments, because I speak to local government organizations about these issues, but also to the amateur radio community, because at some point, almost all of us want to build a tower or want to string up a different wire antenna. And knowing what the rules are that apply to those conversations and what the rules are that allow or disallow those antennas to be constructed are as important for you to know as it is for people like me to know. And it's fundamentally just as more important for you to know them because not, in not every case are you going to call somebody like me. The Volunteer Council program is an ARRL sanctioned program. You do not have to be a member of the ARRL to take advantage of us. We are li the uh, VCs are listed on the ARRL website. Most of us who are VCs also listed on our personal websites that we have that um, additional uh, sanction from the ARRL. Um, Almost all of us are free, are, are available for quick consults. Call me on the phone. Here's what I'm thinking about doing. What do you think? That conversation doesn't cost you anything. It's when we have the conversation about, I want you to help me walk through this process. That's when we start talking about what's it cost. 
I do all of these on the administrative side of the case at a flat fee. You know walking in what the number is, that's gonna be the number, it's never gonna change, that's the number. Once we get outside of the administrative process and into litigation, that's a different conversation. But the administrative process is done at a flat fee, which is typically less than half of the cost of your tower. So that's what I, that's what I know, may or may not be much, but I welcome any questions you may have. Thanks for your time. I do. Actually, I do not do divorces. Um, um, I, I, have, uh, I have a number of friends who do domestic relations law. I am not one of them. As I tell people, my parents are the therapist, uh, not me. I don't do marriage counseling. Um, so, no, I, I'll be glad to put, put you in touch with somebody who says that, but no, that's not going to be me. This is not going to stay on. Jim, do you need this on anymore? Other questions? So the bottom line, is there an HOA forget it, and get it, whatever that, the HOA agreement? And, uh, Jack and I were talking about this a little, a little earlier. I, mean, I never say forget it. What I will say is it depends on what your membership looks like. It depends on what the covenants and restrictions look like and it depends on how much of a conversation you're able to have with your board. North of 75% of the CCRs in Georgia delegate um, discretion to the board of directors on the application of, of how the, the terms are supposed to be applied, how the CCRs are supposed to be applied. If you can get three of the five board members to say that what you wanna do is okay, then that's worth having a conversation over. If you live in a, in a, organ, in a HOA where um, the community is more likely to recall that, you know, back when they were small, every time the neighborhood ham fired up his um, one and a half uh, uh, kilowatt uh, amplifier, you couldn't watch TV that may not be a conversation you can win. But HOAs are not something you can win as a matter of law. Uh, in fact, there was a case recently in California where a ham sued his HOA trying to invoke PRB1 to say he was entitled to build his antenna. Not only did he lose, but the Superior Court in Ventura County ordered that the ham had to pay the HOA's lawyer's fees um, in addition to his own lawyer's fees for that lawsuit. So. Do you lose? Most times if you litigate it, yes. Is it worth having a conversation? I, I'm never opposed to conversation. Others? It's yeah. an interesting one in our covenants, at least the original covenants, maybe it's changed. It says no antenna can be greater than 10 feet. <laughs> What's that mean? Well, does it well does it mean ten does it mean ten feet from the roof of the house? Does it mean ten feet in diameter? Does it mean ten feet in radius? Does it mean ten feet above average grade? I mean, I can ask. I, I think they were talking about ten foot dishes. In the <laughs> Probably, um, but all of that's preempted by the 1991 Telecommunications Act anyway. Now, so if that's the only restriction that's in there on antennas, and that one's preempted and they've not done something to fix it, then you've got at least an argument that there's no restriction on antennas whatsoever under those CCRs. So I can say it's, it's always worth a conversation. Um, whether or not you get anywhere or not is not in our control at that point. Others. Again, thank you for your time.